Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for our uh, second 101 workshop of 2023. Uh, this year, this year we are breaking the mold from the previous year. Um, in 2022, we uh, every month we cycled through quarterly and hit Green Party 101, Eco Socialism 101, Organizing 101. Uh, we did that for the full year, uh, cycling through those those workshops, and uh, coming into 2023, we said we were gonna uh, not abandon those, but uh, mix it up a little. So we opened in January with a uh, cut down one hour version of our Green Party 101, uh, and then this month we are uh, doing what is was obviously out, which was honestly the obvious choice, um, independent politics 101. Um, we talked about independent politics in probably every single one of our previous uh, um, 101 workshops. It, it's key to understanding the Green Party. It's key to understanding socialism. It's key to, uh, you know, doing effective bottom-up organizing. So, um, you know, today we're going to talk about independent politics 101. Um, much of today, one thing we did say when we were getting ready for this was, uh, this is a workshop we're probably going to come back to. Uh, this is a workshop we're going to tinker, um, you know, and, and figure out. Uh, but for this first independent politics workshop today, we uh, are going to use Howie Hawkins' ebook, uh, The Case for an Independent Left Party, um, kind of as our guide. Though we did mix up, you know, the order a little, and uh, we we added some things as well. Um, but but for this first one, that ebook is going to uh, to be our guide. Um, you can. Uh, get the link into the chat but you can like i said it's free and you can get it at greensocialist.net um, right up at top it says ebook or you can go to that link so uh yeah to get started um my name is chris blankenhorn um, i'm uh, the illinois green party secretary uh former national co-chair for the green party of the united states and uh, one of the organizers with the Green Socialist Organizing Projects Education Working Group. Um, <clears throat> with me is Garrett Wasserman, and I'll let him tell you about his hats. <laughs> yeah, hi everyone. I'm Garrett, and uh, I'm a, I guess, a, also a former GPS co-chair at this point. We um, that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's uh, it's been a long term, and um, I resigned a little bit early because I want to focus more on doing these workshops and educational stuff. Um, so, but in addition to that, I've been active in the Green Party of Pennsylvania and the Green Party of Allegheny County, which is uh, Pittsburgh, uh, where I've worked on a number of ballot access campaigns to, you know, put the Green Party on the ballot and, uh, you know, work to organize and educate. So uh, that's what we're here for. So I'm excited. Let's let's jump into it, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so independent politics, right? Um, it, it is a probably one of the central debates of the left. Um, you know, I would say in two ways. One, um, fundamentally, the debate about independent party independence, right? Um, there, there are, there's the independent left, and then there's a whole left uh, that is, at least in some way, uh, tethered to or oriented towards the Democratic Party. Um, so, you know, that's a big, it, we, it's called a strategy debate often. Um, you know, we take the position that it's actually not a strategy. It shouldn't be considered a strategy debate. It, it, independence is fundamental uh, to socialist organizing. It, it's not something that should be up for debate. Um, it, it's a key part of uh, what we mean when we say we're socialist organizers. Um, you know, so it, it's that important, um, you know, it's a really important part of the discussion. But then also... Um, it brings into the conversation electoralism, um, which is another major point of debate on uh, the in the U.S. left, um, right? So, um, I, I think it, it's it's good to talk about it and talk about it um, in both those contexts. But uh, to start off, we're going to start off with some quotes, um, just kind of, you know, get us 
hearing some perspective on this um, from some key thinkers. An obvious one, uh, a very popular one, is it's better. Eugene Deb said it's better to vote for what you want and not get it than to vote for what you don't want and get it. Um, and it's that that's a quote from a century ago that is so applicable in our modern politics, right? I I, I talk often about um, in the United States, we I, I the way I term it is we have a uh, we have a negative voting culture. Right, where people vote against things rather than voting for them. Um, you know, Mo, I would bet if you asked most voters in, 20, in 2020, especially for presidential, right, I bet most voters would list things they were voting against primarily, right? We, same in 2016, right? We have incredibly unpopular uh, mainstream candidates, uh, yet million, tens of millions of people voted for each of them. Um, and many of them did so. Uh, while openly expressing their disgust, right? So we have a, a political culture that has us voting for what we don't want. Uh, and that, that guarantees that we're going to get it and we're not going to like it. So um, you know, despite this being a hundred year old quote, it, it's dead on for uh, you know, the current US political culture um, and, and the, the negative you know the, the negative oriented voting that we have. Next up is a little longer um, and even older from Karl Marx. Um, even when there is no prospect whatsoever of their being elected, the workers must put up their own candidates in order to preserve their independence, count their forces, and bring it before the and bring before the public their revolutionary attitude and party standpoint. In this connection, they must not allow themselves to be seduced by such arguments of the Democrats as, for example, that by doing so they are splitting the Democratic Party and making it possible for the reactionaries to win. That ultimate intention of all such phrases is to dupe the proletariat, the advance of which the proletarian party is bound to make by such independent action is indefinitely more important than the disadvantage that might be incurred by the presence of a few reactionaries in the representative body, right? So um, Marx very much makes the point that uh, we need to put ourselves out there. And one of the ways that we would do that, we can do that is, uh, you know, through party politics, independent party politics. Um, Garrett, do you have anything on that one? I took it from your la from you last last month. <laughs> yeah, um, I I think my comment, both for uh, Eugene Debs' quote as well as uh, from Karl Marx here, is that there's a very rich history. Um, throughout socialist history going back a long time, both in Europe with Marx and in the U.S. with Debs, of uh, a focus on independent politics being very important to building working class power, um, you know, against the, the, the bourgeoisie, right? Against the, uh, the, uh, the ruling class, the owning class, the capitalist class, whatever you want to call it. Um, we can't build our own working class power by working within those structures that are meant to uh, constrain us into the system as it exists today. We have to build our own um, institutions that can carry working class power. And so, you know, that means starting off with independence, even knowing that that's going to be difficult at first, but um, there's no shortcut to, to winning working class power. We have to start organizing from the, the bottom up, from the ground up. Yeah, I really like the phrase of not for. Right. Um, <clears throat> we don't need to be advocates. We need to, you know, build and empower the working class as a whole. Um, you know, not uh, not simply be outsiders who advocate on behalf of them, which is all you could ever really do from within a capitalist party. Um, that leads us into the next one, which is Lenin. Um, far from causing harm to the revolutionary proletariat. Sorry, there's an unhappy toddler. <laughs> Far from causing harm to the revolutionary proletariat, participation in a bourgeoisie democratic parliament, even a few weeks before the victory of the Soviet Republic, and even after such a victory, actually helps the proletariat to prove the backward, to the backward masses why such parliaments deserve to be done away with. It facilitates their successful dissolution and helps make, the, make bourgeoisie parliamentarism politically obsolete. Um, so... You know, Lenin even makes the point that even if we disagree with the structures in which we are running, running in them exposes their 
uh, failures, right? And, and, and can actually accelerate, um, you know, the, the, the dissolution of, um, you know, the, these bodies that uh, aren't usually actually democratic, right? <laughs> um, like in the United States, we live in the United States, we like to talk about democracy, but there's, this is never was intended to be a democracy. This was a government by and of and for oligarchs from the beginning. Um, you know, and so Le even Lenin says, even if you don't support the institutions that you're running in, uh, you can do, you know, one of the tools that we have in our uh, tool chest is to, uh, you know, run in those elections and expose the systems that, uh, you know, are that we, that we oppose. Um, you know, and I, I think an important thing to think about when we're having, you know, this discussion about party politics and electoralism, um, you know, I think the, the main important point is to not think of it as either or. We've got to be doing electoralism, you know, dual power, mutual aid, community organized. We, we need many, many fronts of organizing if we're going to overcome capitalism. So, um, you know, while we may kind of talk a lot about elect electoral stuff in this workshop because it's about party politics, um, that is not a, uh, you know, advocacy that electoral politics is the end all be all and where we should put um, you know, even all of our, you know, even a, a, a large portion of our, uh, of our work, how much work, how much focus, we talk about this in our organizing workshop some, right? Like at any given time in your local organization, it may make sense or not to run people. It depends where you are in your development. Um, but we should always keep it as a, you know, something in our tool chest and, you know, something that I've always thought on this issue um, as someone who's involved in electoral politics but hates them, um, you know, much like Lenin seems to, um, you know, is, is the idea that, like it or not, power has been sequestered within the electoral realm, um, not just in the United States, but in, in many ways for most of the world. And so if we are, you know, as, as the left, as socialists, going to abandon you know, if we're going to abandon one of the main areas where power, the ability to exert power in our society exists, it's we're we're very much limiting ourselves, right? Um, like it or not, that's where it is. So we need to fight there. We also need to fight other places, um, but it's one of the places we need to, you know, at, at least consider tactically, uh, and not just write off. Do you have anything before I jump to the next, which changes? So this next one, if voting changed anything, they'd make it illegal, right? Um, and this is generally a quote that is used as a rallying call against electoralism, um, often by anarchists, which is unsurprising, given it's coming from Emma Goldman, an, an anarchist. Um, but one thing I've always really liked about this quote um, is that it's prophetic, and it showed an understanding of history um, you know, while this seem, may seem like a condemnation, and I'm sure it was coming from her, uh, it, it's also a statement of fact. When voting has threatened to actually change things, they make it illegal, right? Um, a key example that even Emma Goldman would have, you know, was around for would be, you know, after World, or after the Civil War, right? We saw a brief flash of black representation in the South, um, and then all of a sudden rules changed. Uh, poll taxes came in, Jim Crow came in, you know, the tests that you had to take, literacy tests came in, and they actually did manage to make it illegal to vote. Um, you know, and, and we see it even in modern times, right? Like um, in 2020, the Democrats in New York used COVID as cover to hide a bill that tripled the amount of signatures it took to get on the ballot as a third party, right? They didn't make it illegal, they just made it de facto impossible. Right, they made it. They 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 knew they couldn't come right out and say, the Green Party, the Libertarian Party, off the ballot. You can't run anymore. Right, that wouldn't even in even in you know what the laughable thing that we call democracy here in the U.S. That wouldn't quite fly. What they can do, and what you know, even the Supreme Court has supported, is make it extremely hard for us to get on the ballot. Right. And so after seeing, you know, successes from the Green Party and statewide campaigns, um, successes from, uh, you know, the 2016 presidential presidential election, uh, the, the Democrats in New York uh, 
inserted into a COVID relief bill. Um, you know, a law that tripled the amount of signatures and made it damn near impossible. Um, a number of signatures no parties could collect it in New York in, I believe, recorded history. And I want to say only once or twice in the last century have has any third party candidate gotten enough votes to qualify under the new law, right? So um, I, while it does seem to be antithetical to what we are talking about, um, I think the prophetic nature of Emma Goldman's quote is, you know, something that we should remember because um, it, power is sequestered there. And when we do are able to actually threaten it, um, they do make it illegal. Um, you know, in Illinois, even if you run for office in Illinois in that packet that you have to fill out to run is a loyalty oath that swears you're not a member of a communist party. Now, that loyalty oath has been declared by the Supreme Court to be null and void. You don't have to fill it out, right? You don't have to turn it in. You don't have to mess with it, but it's in there. And I bet you a lot of candidates do still fill it out. Um, so I, I think it's important to to remember when we have this conversation that, uh, you know, it does present an avenue that real challenges to power can happen. Uh, mm -hmm. and it does, they, they tend to make it illegal. Yeah. Restrict it. Yeah, that, that was always kind of the, the um, I don't know if ironic is the right word, but the um, the, the different way that I would see this, because you're right, a, a lot of folks will throw it around mm -hmm. um, as sort of a justification for I shouldn't be involved in electoralism. But really, it's kind of the opposite, that um, uh, voting, and maybe not the act of voting by itself, but the act of organizing independent politics, of organizing for uh for issues and organizing for candidates that will support those issues and all is where the power is and whenever that starts to form is when you start to see restrictions on um elections and the voting process um you know uh when candidates run together we refer to that as a ticket and in history it, it was a ticket because you would literally cut out a ticket like a coupon from like a newspaper or something you'd say hey i like these candidates in the ad and i'm going to vote for them and you would drop that ticket into the voting booth um and things like that and because of various uh reasons here uh, for one thing there could have been like fraud and things like that but one way that used to press independent candidates and all is by putting in all of these um uh, state barriers to getting on the ballot and you have the state control who's on the ballot and you have the state control who's allowed to vote and who's registered to vote and um, all of these things. So they keep putting these restrictions on there over time um, that almost make it illegal or at least almost make it illegal to vote for anything but the, the folks that are already in power. Um, so uh, in some sense, it actually confirms this, that um, voting and organizing Organizing the vote and really, like I said, broadly organizing independent politics is something that can be very threatening to power, which is why they try to restrict it so much and restrict the conversation uh, with by making it harder to vote and convincing you that, you know, oh, it's just a spoiler and it doesn't matter and you know, all this stuff. Right. So um, we should consider it uh, how useful it is to get to use electoralism, both to to push our own power in, in legislative ways, but also um to organize our forces like Marx was talking about and to, to put our message out to the public um, and use it as a platform to educate others about um, the changes that society really needs to get to where we need to go. Um, so uh, yeah, I, you know, green socialism and the green party are about more than just electoralism. It's an activist organization too, as we've said in previous um, uh, one-on-ones and we'll talk about more as we go. All right. <laughs> So like we said, we're going to use um, our free ebook, The Case for an Independent Left Party. Uh, the link is in the chat. You can get it. You know, it, it's super short, right? Um, one of the re reasons I love this ebook and one of the reasons why we talk about it and push it so much is it's incredibly short and digestible, right? The whole thing is less than 30 pages total. Each, I, I don't think there's a section probably that's more than two pages, right? So... And it's pieced out in a way that makes it so you could read one section, discuss it, read one section, discuss it, right, in your local or in your locals and things like that. So that's our model, right? Um, 
for this workshop, we did rearrange it a little. So let's talk about what we have first, right? It's a, it, before we start having a conversation on what we should have, we need to make sure we have a firm understanding of what we do have. And here in the United States, we have what are called memberless parties. Um, the party tends to be tightly controlled by insiders that know the rules. Um, insiders tend to be elected officials and staff putting and staff putting the party under political donor control rather than accountable to voters or the public. Uh, donors pay for access to insiders. Insiders then use that money to campaign and get insiders reelected to keep the keep up the cycle. Right, where this is how the institutional uh, parts of the Republican and Democratic parties work. Um, party conventions are now patronage rituals for fundraising and marketing, um, just like any other capitalist enterprises, rather than deliberative gatherings. Um, you know, there, the, it used to be that the the presidential candidates were decided at the uh, at the nominating conventions. And now they are, you know, like that says, just giant PR shows. And then without a membership structure, voters do not have any rights or duties within the party. And therefore, typically there's no course of action within the party against representatives and officers that don't represent them. Um, so, you know, the big a, a big problem with parties and how they exist and how they manifest in the United States is that, um, you know, I think the key there is, is a real key there is the bottom is that last point, right? There's no membership structure. Um, parties don't, when people say they're a Democrat, I don't know what that means other than they vote Democrat when they vote. Um, because for the most part, and there are exceptions, right? Uh, there, are, there are people who uh, serve as precinct committee people. There are people who might go to you know, a local membership meeting or something like that. Um, but for the most part, voters have no active role within their party. Um, they don't have an active role really in any way other than voting. Um, most of them aren't even voting in primaries, right? Where you actually might, where your vote might actually say one way or the other, um, where you are on policies that are in debate within, um, you know, within within the Democratic Party. So, like, if you're a if you're one of the ninety plus percent of Democrats that support Medicare for, supported Medicare for all in 2020, and knew you were voting Democrat, you know, come general election, the only chance you got to make that expression of your support for for Medicare for all was during the primary, right? That, that's the only time, and, and most voters don't vote in the primary mm -hmm. um, because once it once it came time to actually uh, you know, be in the general election, Medicare for all wasn't on the table, right? The, the Democratic your, the Democratic nominee had said he would veto it if it even if it got passed. Um, so when you have these voter-based parties where that's the only identifier you have, um, it really means that the people have no control. Mm -hmm. The people have no power. Um, we even saw in, um, was it Nevada? where a progressive slate took control of the state party yeah the nevada dsa i think actually yeah. took over the state party and they got people yeah. elected to enough positions that they had a majority in the state party and with i don't remember if it was within a year they, it was just recently that they put out this letter um but they recently put out a letter within a year or two of, of actually succeeding in taking power that it was impossible to reform the Democratic Party. <laughs> that even from positions of power, they couldn't, they yeah. could not break the hold, and uh, they advocated for a break. Yeah, and and see, I, their letter touches on basically the I think the two key points from this slide. That first, when the DSA took over the state party, the donors for the Nevada Democratic Party weren't going to support uh, people that claim to be socialists and all. So all of the donors left, all of the money left, um, the old leadership of the party literally transferred out all of the money to to other Democratic campaign committees so that this, the Nevada State Party had nothing left, basically. And they didn't have money to pay staffers and stuff, so the staffers left and went to go support other Democratic Party things. So... Um, the Nevada Democratic Party that was taken over by DSA had basically nothing left because it they had no donors, um, and they also didn't have this membership structure. Um, uh, so they couldn't participate in the rest of the Democratic Party, which essentially locked them out. Um, so, uh, you know, we see kind of the problems on the slide and exactly their experience at trying to take over a, a state party. 
Um, and this is this lack of membership is really the fundamental issue with with all capitalist parties, um, not just Republicans and Democrats, but you know we, we see that in, in um, even other parties that we'll talk about. Um, you're you're not a member; you're just a voter, and so you don't have any influence. You don't have any say. You don't have any vote on internal party policy. So, for example, when uh, presidential candidates are picked and all, they also technically put together uh, a platform and stuff like that. Do you vote on the platform? No, it's it's party insiders, it's super delegates. All of those folks put together what they want to see the Democratic Party doing, uh, not what you know, uh, not with the input of um, the the grassroots mem uh, people because there are no members in the Democratic Party. I actually just found their statement and put it in the chat. Um, so folks can read it. Right? So we talked about, you know, it's a good segue into, you know, ref do these reforms work? Right? So during the progressive era, era uh, the primary system was implemented in the 1910s. It was meant to take candidate selection out of the hands of party bosses. Um, however, I think we have a pretty clear view today, you know, 120 years later about how successful that's been, right? Um, they weren't deterred. They simply became the managers of the primaries, right? Um, I, I, we always have to remember when we're doing this organizing that is fundamentally anti-capitalist organizing that capitalism is incredibly adaptable, right? It, it, its ability to adjust to systems of power um, it, it is really incredible. <laughs> um, it, it, a lot of it comes with having a lot of money, right? And, exi and already having the power. It's easier to adjust if you're already in power and you're sitting on a pile of money. Um, you, you can shift a lot easier than, than the grassroots can. Um, you know, but yeah, fundamentally, um, when we're doing this work, we've got to remember that uh, if we're just slightly tweaking a system, if we're not fundamentally changing things, if we're not fundamentally changing the, the lay of the land, um, we're at a disadvantage in terms of who can adapt faster. So if, if we you know take one hierarchical system, one anti-democratic hierarchical system that was party bosses choosing candidates and replace it with a easily manipulated uh, primary system that was in the hands of the states and in the hands of the, the party bosses, um, it, it should be pretty easy to see that that capitalism and capitalist parties are going to be able to shift and uh, take advantage of that old system just as much as they did now, as they did the, the new system just as much as they did the old, which means we have to have some caution, you know, when it comes to isolated reforms today. Um, and what you know, one question I always ask coming from Illinois, what good are, is RSV if only Republicans and Democrats can get on the ballot? Um, right. There, there's there are multiple standalone ranked choice voting bills in the Illinois legislature right now. Uh, the Illinois Green Party is actually discussing which ones we should support. And we always support with critical support. Right. Um, we support this, but we need X, Y and Z, too. Um, and so when you come, when you look at a state like Illinois, uh, where we have some of the worst ballot access repression in the country, uh, where to run for U.S. House from my district where I live in central Illinois, as a Republican or a Democrat, it takes between 700 and 800 signatures. To run as a Green Party member, it takes me more than 15,000 in 90 days in a largely rural district. Um, and I, we got to double it, right? So we actually got to get 30,000 signatures in 90 days. Um, and then that's that's more households that exist in my state capital where I live, right? So we're going to have to go into the deep red country where I grew up to get signatures too. So we can pass, third, we can pass ranked choice voting bills in Illinois all we want, right? But it's not going to change anything except internal party politics for the Republicans and Democrats if we they implement it in their in their primaries, which hurts us because it lures us in, right? It lures independents into voting Democrats so they can try to sway those primaries. But in Illinois, if you vote in the Democratic primary, that means there are certain things you're excluded from doing as an independent, right? Uh, you can't I people always ask me why I didn't vote in the Democratic primary in 2020, because if I had, I wouldn't have been able to be an electoral college elector for the Greens, 
right? The law says I can't. Um, and so when we fight for these, you know, another one is term limits, right? Um, term limits are pushed by people on both sides of the aisle, um, you know, as a way to, to counter corruption and career politicians. But will they fundamentally challenge things or will power be able to pivot, right? Will there, instead of being a career politician, be a line of career politicians ready to take their eight-year stand as U.S. House, or as state House members, and then they can switch over and they can run for city or county or state senate or U.S. Congress, right? Um, will, it, will it just create a revolving door of puppets instead of one corrupt puppet? Um, and, and when I was thinking about this when I wrote it earlier today, one thing I wondered was, would that make the corruption, could that make the corruption worse? Where you've only got eight years to fill your pockets. You don't got 30, right? And so now it's a rush of, you know, getting your pet projects done and, and all that, because you've got a very limited time where you're able to be in power and do it. And my argue, my big argument with against term limits has always been um, it hurts working class candidates, right? Um, if you're going to run and then know the job's gone in four years because you can only serve two terms as a representative, that's a big ask for a working class candidate to put it all on the line, right? To leave the job they have that's that's feeding their family uh, for a chance at a job that will, you know, knowingly be done and send them into a, you know, a career reset unless they can, you know, pivot like the capitalists can, which they likely can't. Um, it, one thing it, it makes me think of is uh, in 2020, we had a green candidate running in Illinois and he got interviewed by the local paper. And the local paper asked him, how will you deal with surviving on a legislator's salary? Illinois has some of the top paid legislature, legislators in the country. They make, I think, 60 to 70,000 baseline, and then you get more based on committee assignments and seniority and stuff. All he could do was laugh, right? He's like, dude, that's double I've ever made in my life. In, in Pennsylvania, they make 90,000. Yeah. Right. And, and so that's how disconnected the working class is from our po political system. And that's because of the, you know, what we talked about, the memberless party structure. Right. And when independent candidates do run, they get asked ridiculous questions like this. Right. Because because their opponents are lawyers or their opponents are landlords. Um, I, I learned the other day, like almost half of Congress is a landlord. Um, and it's like 428 out of the 535 or 228 out of the 535 or something, um, right? Or their opponent owns huge swaths of farmland across the county, right? And, and they're going to be slumming it for $60,000 a year. <laughs> so we have to have a level of caution, especially when we're talking about one-off isolated reforms, right? And this is the one big reason why Greens, Independent, Socialists should be pushing large, broad, omnibus dem you know, democracy reforms. Um, because once we get our, our you know, ranked choice voting, they're not going to give us anything else for another few decades. That's like one of those once in a generation changes. That means ballot access is off the table, right? That means Citizens United is off the table. That means multi-member districts, which are the real game changer of ending uh, the first past the post system, right? Those are off the table. So we've got to make sure that even when we are advocating for these, you know, one-off reforms that we're also advocating for the big picture and keeping in mind how, you know, these reforms are being done within the capitalist party parties, which means that they're being done within the limits of what these parties think they can survive. They would never put themselves willing and willingly at risk like this, right? If they pass it, it means they think they can t can continue to dominate in it. So we've got to keep that in mind. Yeah, I I'd add real fast that uh, while this was focused on electoralism, uh, the the same is true about union organizing and all that. At this time period, there were uh, radical unions that were really questioning the the fundamental um, tenets of capitalism and and the wage labor system itself. And um, to be part of the New Deal coalition in order to get some reforms instead of major system change, they, they got involved in the Democratic Party and watered down. And today's unions now are largely managers of capital as opposed to, um, uh, you know, opposing capital itself. 
So, you know, we have to, uh, and again, that, you know, that's working with capital and the democratic party. So it's, it's a, it's a caution both from like the union side and from the, um, political party side that, uh, we have to maintain our independence when we're fighting for a new system. So the debate, <laughs> right? The inside strategy debate, um, it's been tried many times. Um, you know, that, that's, that's the thing that's always baffled me about it, um, is the, that it seems like every iteration of the inside strategy thinks it's discovered something that we haven't tried before. Um, we're in, in, you know, that's in, why I was very clear on this sl slide here that, um, you know, we talked about the failures of trying to reform, um, you know, primaries and all this stuff. And so the next idea everyone has is, well, let's try to change the Democratic Party. And that's what the inside strategy essentially is. Take it away. And then, yeah, and there's and there's a couple of different approaches here. There's uh, an inside outside uh, fusion strategy where it's like, well, I'm kind of independent, but I kind of work with the with the Democrats when I need to as a fusion. And the other approach is the party within a party approach that you try to behave as like a caucus within uh, the Democratic Party that pushes for change. And you can see from the slides here under both of them that like since the late 1800s. Both of these approaches have been tried over and over and over and over again. None of these ideas are new ideas. You know, DSA didn't just suddenly discover, hey, we can be a, a caucus within the Democratic Party. This has been tried over and over and over again uh, with the same results every time that it's been done. They've tried it over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, DSA itself has been around since the 60s, more or less. I mean, it's a little complicated history, but... Um, but, you know, that's what's listed here. The People's Party of 1896, the American Labor Party of the 1930s through the 50s, the Liberal Party of New York, that's still, that's from the end of World War II till today, the Vermont Progressive Party, the Working Families Party. Uh, we see the party within a party approach going back to McGovern's campaign, but, you know, DSA, uh, the Rainbow Coalition, Democracy for America, all the way up to Sanders, uh, Bernie Sanders, Our Revolution. Where is it? it? It didn't create an independent political structure. It just folded into the Democrats. And so we see this, this same track happen every single time um, a new candidate or a new organization tries it. It always gets co-opted and folded into the Democratic Party and folded into the needs of capital um, instead of being able to maintain its independence and actually push for, you know, true socialist systemic change. So, you know, the verdict here is that they get co-opted into the, into the Democratic Party and most reformists end up becoming careerists. They end up becoming the people that work within the Democratic Party. You know, you can look at the <laughs> list of names here. Um, you know, Howard Dean, um, uh, Kucinich, Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Woo, that's right. <laughs> Kucinich, Obama, Sanders, every single one of them was considered to be this outside reformer when they started. And then after their campaign, they became, you know, insider, DSA, super deli, uh, I'm sorry, not DSA, insider, um, Democratic Party superdelegates, you know, with their special place within the party, and 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 um, you know, they uh, they became people uh, that would bring uh, those progressive movements into the party, as opposed to trying to push them into more uh, of an independent space. So, you know, this is not new, and it's not even like, well, we tried it once, and maybe we could do it a little bit better, right? It's like over a hundred years at this point of trying it over and over and over again and showing the failures. Um, so, you know, most of the reformists end up as careerists within the party. Most of these organizations get folded into the party. Um, and these organizing efforts, um, part of the reason they fail is because they always start off not as independent, um, you know, working class organizations and parties, but they're always formed as these top down nonprofit sort of organizations that focus on mobilizing for the Democratic Party instead of helping communities organize for their own um, self-determination. Um, and they're as nonprofits, you know, they just collect profits and they start to pool donors, right? They still, they end up with that same problem of um, being donor funded organizations as opposed to membership organizations. And so they end up with exactly the same problems that the Democratic Party itself has, which is partly why they're so easily co-optable. Um, so I think this, this long time record of these different strategies, um, again, points us toward the importance of maintaining independence, uh, which we'll talk more about as I go. But let me throw it to Chris for comments. 
Yeah, I mean, one thing I always I say when we talk about this quite a bit is The Democrats of Critical History by Lance Selfa. Um, it's on Haymarket Press. He actually owes us a new one, an updated version. Um, but it, it goes into detail onto a lot of this. Um, it goes into detail about, you know, as it says, a critical history, right? Um, of looking at, at the history of the Democratic Party and the history of, of uh, attempts to, uh, you know, reform it. And, you know, anytime I hear Kucinich, one of the first, you know, horror stories that I heard um, <clears throat> when I became active in the National Green Party uh, was another young Green at the time who told me a story, and that is that um, Kucinich came to their state party during the primary when he was running and said, I want to do a list swap. I want, you know, I want you to give me your membership lists and I will use them to try to move the discussion in the Democratic Party to the left. I don't think anyone was delusional enough to think that Kucinich was going to win. So really the only thing on the table could have been moving the conversation. And then the agreement was after the primary, Kucinich would turn over his lists to the Green Party. Um, that deal was made. Kucinich was given the lists. Greens were lobbied by Kucinich, by his uh, Democratic primary campaign. His campaign ended. That list then went to the Democratic Party, and the Green Party got nothing. Um, right? And, and, and to be clear, this is I, I don't know what the state of the Democrats' legal maneuvering in terms of their primary at the time. Um, but like when Bernie Sanders ran in 2016 and 2020, he signed contracts saying every single person in my contact list goes to the DNC, right? That, that is a condition of running in the primary was that you share uh, your lists with the DNC afterwards. So I remember in 2016, all these Bernie supporters up in arms about why are they getting Clinton emails? Well, Bernie sold you out. It was part of the agreement, and he sold you out before he even announced he ran, right? <laughs> he sold you out when he signed that first round of paperwork, and he did the same thing, right? Um, and, and it should have been clear. The trap should have been clear to the that state party, but it wasn't, and they, they took the deal and uh, got screwed over. And it really, like I said, it shouldn't surprise anyone, um, but that's what happens when we you know try to insert ourselves into this and i often hear a question of well if greens don't have a candidate shouldn't we endorse someone right or shouldn't we put our our view out there because otherwise we don't have a voice um which in a way can be true um but the the problem with that is when you do that right when you don't have a candidate running in your local city council race so you endorse a de facto democrat in said because most of the time city council at least here in illinois is, is nonpartisan, right so they're they're not a democrat or they're you know they're no one's anything but we all know um when you do that you use your voice solely to build up another party Right? You use that, you, you take all of your energies that should be put into building an independent political alternative. And you take all those energies and all that focus and what little, you know, what little cred and attention you have, um, and you put it into building the Democratic Party instead of yourself. Um, so there are definitely ways that, uh, you know, Greens that don't have a candidate in the race can engage, especially on advocating for issues. And, and making sure that the, you know, eco-socialist perspectives are, are part of the discussion in ways, but um, very rarely is, uh, you know, throwing their voice behind a Democrat something that pays off in the long term. Um, e even in times I can think of when I know of green locals who have supported Democrats, when they're elected, their voice doesn't carry any weight. Right, just like just like the rest of the grassroots of the Democratic Party doesn't carry any weight with their electives, um, you know the 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 Greens also right. Once they once they throw their weight in behind a Democrat when they're elected, they don't get a seat at the table. Um, we're, we're still outside.
So that, you know, it leads us to the question, what would a socialist alternative to the Democrats look like? Um, it must adopt a strong socialist program for economic democracy and social ownership of the mean, means of production, right? It's got to be socialist, um, not merely uh, reforms of capitalism. Um, and, you know, I, I know a lot of people credit Bernie with bringing socialism to the mainstream, but the problem with how he did it was that he also distorted it while doing it. Um, and I, I honestly, I don't blame, put much blame on Bernie personally for this. Uh, Bernie didn't say the word socialism very much after the very, very beginning. Um, because I think Bernie probably is at least some level of a socialist. It was like, this isn't socialism. <laughs> um, this is social you know, democracy. This is social welfare capitalism. Um, so, you know, a key part of what would a socialist alternative to the Democrats look like is it would be socialist, right? It wouldn't just reform capitalism. And as I said earlier, right, when you're reforming capitalism from within the capitalist parties, you're guaranteeing that there's a ceiling to what your reforms can do. You're, they will not allow themselves to be reformed out of existence, right? That, that, that's just not something that uh, is going to happen. Um, so what does a, a socialist alternative to the Democrats look like? It's also got to be politically independent. Um, political independence must be adopted as a key principle, not merely a tactic to be used or dropped each election cycle. Um, and, and I think that each election cycle is important. Right? It, it's important for independent socialist organizers. It's important for Greens to understand we're talking about long-term organizing. We're talking about long-term community building. We're talking about long-term empowerment. We're not talking about immediate gratification wins and uh, you know, jumping cycle to cycle to cycle. Um, we really have to be focused you know, on, on putting the work in on that long-term ground game. Um, so that means we need to be working on independent funding Right, self-funded by workers and communities. Um, how he had a, a article during the campaign about called Sanders socialism is New Deal liberalism, which is correct, right? Um, Sanders is a New Dealer, or his policies are. You know, his presidential campaign policies were New Deal, you know, reforms essentially. Um, and but in that article, in that essay, he talked about how. Clinton was when Clinton was elected, he had the most moderate of moderate economic reforms in his program. And even then, what he learned was Wall Street gets a veto. Right? If you are not independently funded, that means capital will have the power to, to defund you, to shut you down. And that's what the Democratic Party of Nevada learned, right? That's what the Las Vegas DSA learned, or the DSA in Nevada learned when they took over the party, was that all of a sudden the funding dried up, the staff quit, and it was you know just the leadership sitting there trying, and how, and they you know and part of the leadership was probably working against them, um, you know. So if you don't have that independent funding, you're you know really building your party on an unstable stack of cards. And not only that, you, it's an unstable capital stack of cards where the capitalists have a bat and, and they can take you down at any point, right? Um, independent ballot lines, working class candidates running on their own ballot lines with their own identity. Um, again, super, super important, right? Because there is, you know, there's always the rallying call from progressives to run and win in the primaries, but they don't. Right, they they run into many of the same problems that the third parties run into. Right, they're a grassroots campaign that's ran on passion and no money, and they're running against someone who's been sitting in office raising fifty thousand dollars a day for their entire term, you know, or fifty thousand dollars a week or whatever the goal is for for a U.S. House member. Right, um, so they go in and they put all everything into these primaries. And then in the end, what are they left with, right? They're in the same exact spot where they were, but they're actually have tied themselves into a party and into a strategy that leads them to then endorse the, you know, vote for the person that beat them, vote for the person they didn't think should be there. Um, we had a funny story about this in, in Pittsburgh a few years back where um, uh, a progressive candidate that was inspired by Bernie Sanders ran for city council uh, in the Democratic primary 
and actually won, actually won the primary, was the Democratic nominee. The Democratic establishment of Pittsburgh got together, uh, funded an insider to run as an independent, <laughs> and, and flooded the campaign with so much money that they won as an independent. And they got the Democratic insider into office on an independent. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so the progressive was stuck with the Democratic name. Um, instead of building institutions that were going to allow a longer working class movement, you know, like that, that win didn't mean anything. It didn't build anything. Um, so, you know, it's important for us to get our own funding and our own ballot line with our own identity instead of being tied to the Democrats, because actually the Democrats, they're not really as, as that issue showed, they're not really that tied to the name democratic party either. It's about keeping their control. And if they have to pick another name or something like that, they will. Um, so really this conversation is about building working class power, building our own institutions where we can actually, you know, raise ourselves up and, uh, actually engage in, uh, self-determination. Like Nathaniel said, like India Walton in Buffalo, New York, um, who, who defeated their incumbent, uh, their incumbent mayor in the primary. Um, but then that mayor ran as an independent or a write-in and beat one in the pri in the general, right? And that's another one of the problems with the strategy of running within uh, the primaries is that there's a much smaller voting pool in the primaries, um, right? It, it tends to be passionate people that vote in the primaries. Um, you know, I, I remember people in 2016 talking about how, you know, Bernie's filling stadiums and Hillary's not even filling high school gyms. And that means something. Well, when you're the institutional candidate, you don't need to fill a stadium. You've got the votes, right? You've locked down the superdelegates. You've locked down all of your, um, you've locked down all of your committee precinct people, <laughs> right? So the, the people in the neighborhood um, are, who want Bernie are going and talking to Democrats in their community only to find out that they're already locked in. Um, and so, you know, especially in a party with super delegates, you, you, how much does the primary vote even matter? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, even when you can sway the primaries, that's a, a smaller sample of largely act, you know, Uber engaged voters. But when you get to the general, now you have to, you know, deal with, um, you know, a moderate, a more moderate base. Usually, it's why in all primaries on both in both Republicans and Democrats, you know, it it's usually a battle between the institution and more extremes. But then they run right back to the center when it comes to the general. Um, and, and tying into that, you know, an independent socialist party needs, um, yeah, emoji. That's who we were talking about was India Walton in Buffalo. Um, it needs member control, um, just as we call for social ownership of the means of production, the party itself must be owned by the members, right? Without independent leftist candidates running on social on the socialist program, the idea of socialist socialism is watered down into the into what the Democratic Party is, you know, and what progressive Democrats are doing, which is mere reform and and government programs, um, not social ownership, which was, you know, the absolute key, uh, you know, it, it's the basic definition of socialism. Um, so we said earlier, right, that we've been that the inside strategy has been tried, right? And there's a history of the independent left strategy too, right? Um, independent left parties carried progressive causes from uh, the 1830s to the 1930s. Um, you know, huge list, Working Man's Party, Liberty Party, Free Soil Party, Republicans, um, you know, talked about cooperative labor, abolition of land reform, radical reconstruction, right? Um, with the Civil War industrialization and the kind of the battle for who was the biggest business party. That, that's what I think, you know, my problem with uh, the argument, you know, the, the surface level shouting of the parties flipped, Right. Um, they didn't really flip. They just engaged in a battle over who was more pro-business. And, and we're still seeing that today, right? Um, the, the, that is the key uh, battle. Or, or, they, or they support different industries that play off each other. But yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's capital against capital. It's not really a... <laughs> 
Yeah. So, you know, there's this long history of, of independent left parties, uh, labor unions and the communist popular communist party's popular front um, supported the New Deal coalition. And that really um, did a lot of damage to the left independent movements. Right. That was a big bellwether moment as of, um, you know, uh, the left collapsing into the Democratic Party. Um, one thing that's not talked as often about that in that realm, in that time period um, is how the world wars were used um, to rein in radical labor movements. Um, you know, they, they were a necessary part of the, the war machine. So, um, you know, it was a, a big time when we saw, you know, traditionally socialist or, you know, leftist bodies um, all of a sudden becoming patriotic and uh you know towing government lines um and, and i think it is important you know despite all this history the united states is one of the only modern industrial countries not to consolidate a major working class party independent from capital right we're going to talk about the one we used to have um in, in the next slide and, and they still do exist but they are not uh, mass party. Um, there's no real mass left independent party in uh, in the United but States. Before we get to that, though, I'd, I'd want to reiterate the uh, the point here that um, there's there's a long tradition through most of U.S. history here, actually, of independent politics. This this idea of the two party system that kind of reigns supreme and there's no other choice is actually a relatively new phenomena in U.S. history. It, it wasn't that weird to vote for other parties, especially when you were talking, you know, local state offices, uh, you know, like there were plenty of regional parties, if not national parties. Um, and, you know, we've lost a lot of that in modern history, in part because of things like um, the, the first and the second Red Scare uh, that were used to, you know, uh, crush opponents of capitalism during the, the World Wars, like Chris was saying, um, as well as the New Deal coalition that was the the carrot to the stick, right, of trying to bring in unions and whatnot into the Democratic Party where they serve capital instead of um, creating that independent base that the working class needs to create systemic change. And another important thing to remember about it, too, is they were successful. Right? And that does continue to today. Greens are generally successful when we are able to run you know, real grassroots campaigns. Um, you know, in the last year, I remember we ran a lot of local offices in Illinois. We won 67% of our races, right? Um, and in Greens are close to 50% of victories in his all throughout history of all of our candidates. So, um, you know, it wasn't just that these parties existed, but they won. And, you know, especially talking about labor socialism, right? Um, the reason we have the eight hour workday, child labor laws, like all of these things is in part because we were not only, you know, saw active labor movements, but we were electing socialists, right? To city councils as mayors and to state houses and the governorships, right? We were, we were electing socialists, um, active independent socialists. And so, you know, as I was said, it, this, this strictly two parties is really, um, a post New Deal era, um, you know, phenomenon. Obviously, there were our, our system breeds, you know, kind of a top two parties, um, but there was much more lively, uh, both ideological and regional. Um, and I, I, I forget if it's later in the presentation or not, but um, I, just to kind of go on that point, you know, there's other countries in the world today that have voting systems similar to ours that still have the same plurality votes first past the post, a lot of the same problems that we see today, but they still have, you know, more than two parties participating in their national governments. You know, the U S really stands out as only having this Republican di uh, Democrat dynamic. And even when you get into independence, right? Um, like Bernie, um, when Bernie was first elected to the house in the nineties, one of the first things that happened was, uh, he signed it. He, he came to an agreement with uh, the Democratic Party, right? He and that, that agreement was he would caucus with them, which means he'll largely vote with them, right? He'll support their leadership, and in exchange, he would get committee assignments, um, you know. And so, 
even the, probably the most well-known independent of the modern era, um, his independence wasn't really independent uh, from capital or the Democratic Party, right? It was very much an independence in name only. Um, it, it tended to manifest itself in a loud bark uh, with no bite, um, you know, and, and we saw it kind of taken to its, what I would say, logical conclusion um, in term of, terms of Bernie's rise, right? When when Joe Biden was elected in 2020 and um, the House, the Democrats had control of the House and the Senate, um, Bernie got that big committee chair spot, right? Bernie got the, the put in that position where he could supposedly uh, guide progressive policies, um, you know, through the Senate and through Congress. And what we saw was not that, <laughs> um, right? We, what we saw was build back badly and an abandonment of the, you know, the social capital bill. And uh, yeah, so even, even getting to that, you know, even making those deals for, um, you know, go... 30 plus years and getting to that point where you were given the position of power, what we learned was that position of power actually isn't a position of power. It's a figurehead position that can easily be undermined when you stack the rest of the votes against the chair. So, so we said, you know, it has existed in the past. We opened with that quote from Eugene Debs, which was, you know, kind of a figurehead of, uh, you know, our case study, which is the Socialist Party of America. Um, it's the only significant mass membership-based party in U.S. history. At its height, it had thousands of, elect of, of elected officials um, to state and local office, even a couple to Congress. It was very successful at influencing policy in the public debate. Two major differences it had from other leftist parties, and it learned these by experience. Um, it banned fusion, uh, required its candidates to run independently, and only dues-paying members could vote on internal party affairs. Um, they maintained a membership convention system for endorsing candidates alongside the state-run primary system, and they would nominate and campaign for candidates in the primary if necessary to maintain independence. Um, that's still true today. Um, right, there, there are still dual systems where sometimes we're allowed to participate in things like primaries and sometimes in places we aren't. Um, the Red Scare led to the jailing of Eugene Debs, the expulsion of uh, Socialist Party members from state legislatures. Uh, by the 1930s, we talked about, right, the new uh, labor was drawn into the New Deal coalition. Um, and later, Socialist Party is fractured even further, right? Um, some of it into form DSA and other organizations within the Democratic Party. Um, some of them into PSL, you know, the Party for Socialism and Liberation came out of uh, the SP of A. Um, and then parties like the Workers World Party came out of PSL. <laughs> so um, they, you know, the, in many ways, the Socialist Party of America was kind of the trunk of uh, you know the modern leftist policy, uh, leftist political party system, um, and we've seen it kind of fracture off in different branches and limbs. But uh, it, it's really the only example we have of this mass membership party in the United States, and it was incredibly successful until it was snuffed out by the Red Scare um, and the associated you know nonsense of those decades. <laughs> And they still do exist. I will, you know, the, the the Socialist Party of the United States is still in existence. I have have been a dual member in the past. They uh, endorsed um, Howie Hawkins and Angela Walker in 2020, which was huge. Um, I, I, in, I can't think of, I don't believe they've endorsed a green like that before. Um, so it was a really big thing for, you know, building that relationship long term. Um, but they are a shadow of their former selves um, today. So where does that leave us, right? Bottom-up organizing, not top-down mobilizing. And I think those are good. Uh, that, that's an important distinction. Not just the bottom-up and top-down, but organizing versus mobilizing, right? And we talked about this kind of in our, our organizing workshops in the past. Um, 
the difference between advocacy and mobilizing and organizing. And I can't remember, I don't think it was Lee Staples that gave us that, but <laughs> I can't remember who we were quoting with that. You know, but advocacy is what we have in the major parties, right? The expectation that a organization of power will advocate for you um, on behalf of your issues, um, which clearly doesn't pan out in, in real, you know, in the real world. Um, then there's mobilizing, which is bringing out your base to pass your things, um, right? It, it's very one directional. It's very, um, you know, top down and oriented towards completing goals that are established by elites. Um, and then there's bottom up organizing, where not only are we trying to mobilize our people, right? Obviously, when we organize, we, the first thing we do is find our socialists, right? The first thing we do is find the people that want to form an organization like we do. Um, so we have we start with our people, but you know, a key part of organizing is changing minds. Um, a key part, and, and if we if we aren't doing that, then we aren't going to be forming a mass party, right? To, to form a mass party, we have to change the collective consciousness. <laughs> or you have to not only get all the socialists into the streets, but convince, you know, the majority of America that socialists aren't evil demons. <laughs> or, uh, what, one way that I like to describe the organizing is um, organizers should be planning to kind of put themselves out of work. That your major goal as an organizer is to train other organizers and let them go off and do things. Um and that, that is how we not only educate about socialist ideas, but it's also how we kind of build that trust and that solidarity um, that's necessary in order to build a mass working class organization because we're letting, uh, well, not letting, I don't mean it that way, but <laughs> um, we're encouraging communities to um, represent themselves, to learn the skills necessary to organize themselves and to uh, create democratic structures for self-governance um, among themselves. Uh, like Chris was saying earlier, um, you know, it's it's of the people, not for the people. Um, and so that's the, the heart of organizing here. Uh, the, ad, the concept of um, advocacy versus mobilizing versus organizing, I think that comes from Jane McAlevey, yeah. who is uh, a major um, union organizer. Um, so, and she has a book called... Um, uh, there's no shortcuts, and I always like that phrase too. There's no shortcuts to organizing power. Um, you know, we have to understand that this is this is kind of a long-term, uh, protracted um, struggle um, that's not going to get resolved in one election cycle, or or even a few election cycles. It's it's a it's a long-term process of changing uh, the culture and the economic system into the eco-socialist system that we want to see. Yeah, and I think that <clears throat> you know the key thing that we need to remember when we're talking about them up, you know, is that that's where we can actually change minds, right? I said we need to build this mass party that we need to overcome, you know, the propagandizing that our population has had about you know the left and socialist ideals um, to the point that like. A couple of weeks ago, it was even in The Last of Us, right? Where, where it's like, that sounds like communism. And it's like, no, it's not communism. And then the wife jumps in. We live on a commune. It's communism, right? Um, we've got to get past that, right? And when, when we're talking about, you know, even something like this, right? Um, when we're talking about talking to people on social media, talking to national level organizations, it's hard to break through, right? But where we can actually have success breaking through is bottom up with our neighbors in our community, right? Um, you know, a couple quick, you know, things that that brings to mind is, you know, last winter there was a well-known activist in my community, and uh, it, it, we had a real bad snowstorm, and they were um, driving, you know, I don't remember where they were going, driving home or whatever, and they saw someone off the side of the road, so they pulled over, jumped out push help push them out and i bet they did this oh, a couple dozen times over the course of the day or the course of the, you know the 24 hours where we had the bad snow and the roads were bad they just made it a point to go out and help people right because that's what socialists tend to do and they you know they help push this guy out and 
the guy afterwards shook their hand and said, I'm Bob. And I said, oh, well, I'm Bill. And the guy went like this and he said, you're not like who I, how I thought you were. Right? His reputation as a leftist organizer preceded him. His name was known amongst right-wingers. But when one of them met them, him on the streets, he helped them. Right? And it, it broke that. Right. He, the next time he hears, you know, all that guys, this, that, and another thing, um, he's probably at least internally going to think, yeah, but he's a nice guy who helped out when I needed it. Even if he doesn't say it, right? There's a crack in the bobble. There's a, there's a, stru- uh, there's a, a, there's a stress point um, that we can exploit, right? I'm a situationist. When we see those, we hit them. Um, and that's one way we can create those cracks is through those interpersonal interactions with people in our community. Um, I had another friend who ran an anarchist uh, community space in a sundown town of 5,000 people in central Illinois. Um, if you don't know what a sundown town is, it's a, a town where historically uh, black folks needed to leave by sundown. Um, and that's where the name came from, right? So we're talking, a, a, I mean, think exactly what you probably stereotypically think when I say downstate Illinois, <laughs> right? A, a town that has had its, all of its manufacturing leave. Um, very, very, very conservative, lots of reactionary and problematic views. And my friend's running an anarchist space that has an anarcho-capitalist flag painted two stories tall on the front of the building, right? Bullet holes in the windows from people driving by and taking pot shots. But on one occasion, he had a, a gentleman in a suit walk in, hand him $500 and say, I hate everything that you stand for but you're the only person in this town who's doing anything for the kids, right? He, he still didn't like him as a person. He thought his politics were shit, but he had to give him credit. He had to support the only person doing the work. And that same friend has said, has sat down with, you know, people who are friends with the people who are shooting his windows out, right? And had conversations. And at the end they say, you know, well, that's what you're talking about. He's like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And there's like, people wouldn't want to shoot you if they knew that was what you were talking about. Like, he literally got told that. Like, I know people who want to kill you, but if they sat down and had this conversation, they wouldn't. Um, so I think it's really important to, you know, remember that when we're talking about bottom-up organizing it, it's it's not just about, you know, the broader strategy, but about the fact that it's actually the the one place we can reach people. Right. We can't reach people screaming at a stranger on the Internet. We can't, you know, we very rarely reach people standing at a mass protest. Right. Where we reach them is talking to the people in our community. Um, so that was a big t- a way tangent. But <laughs> it, was, to the, you yeah, know, it, was, it was a good one. And it's and it's related to these points here, I think, actually, because it's. um, You know, I think those those opportunities for uh, interpersonal uh uh, actions where uh, and uh, communications where you can change minds. Um, a lot of that happens when, like you're saying, you get uh, involved in your community to do things that um, the local establishment has forgotten about, the local power structures have forgotten about. Um, and that applies to a lot of the people in those communities themselves. Uh, the Democratic electoral machine likes to call them apathetic, that they don't care about politics, because if they cared, they would come out and vote in the primary. That's not true for most of them. Most of them feel completely alienated by this system. They don't feel represented by it, and they, they recognize how hard it is to make it change, and they feel demoralized by that. So they've simply withdrawn from the process altogether. They say, why should I even waste my time on this? Because no one's going to listen to me. No one's going to do anything. No one's going to fix it. I might as well stay in my community and give $500 to the anarchist who's actually doing something. <laughs> um, and when you look at polls, like half of registered voters are um, independents. Like, they already don't really believe in the Republican-Democrat divide. Um, and that's half of all voters. When you look at actually all voting age population, like, half of the population isn't even registered to vote or doesn't vote and that sort of thing. And that's actually where our base is. That's actually the members that we need to be reaching out to um, and recruiting and talking to them and saying, you know, we understand why you're alienated. We understand why you feel demoralized. And the answer to those things is to organize, to get together uh, with 
with other members in our community and start linking those communities together into a larger mass movement where we can actually have the working class power to change these things and represent ourselves and get the policies that we want passed and not just what the Democratic or Republican elite tell us that they're going to do. Um, so, you know, that's that's where this bottom up organizing starts from. It's from those those very personal conversations, getting involved in your community and reaching out to the people that the system has forgotten, because there's a lot of those people um, who are forgotten and are just not sure where to start. And if we can start those conversations with them, you know, they'll get involved. So what does it mean to bottom up organize? Right. It means the ruling middle class political. So what we're talking about is the ruling middle class political alliance only prevails in elections because the working class votes in low numbers, right? Many work members of the working class feel alienated, demoralized at the prospects of making change against the elites. It's not apathy, but a lack of organization to change. And I'll also you know, say here, you'll see this explode in your community every once in a while, right? Where all of a sudden, like your neighbors, someone in your neighborhood is just pissed off at your older person and they run, right? There's somebody down the block for me that he's a write-in and our older person is who is behind him being kicked off the ballot, right? That It was that person's people who challenged his signatures. And I wish I would have, this is a failing on my part, right? That I'm not engaged enough doing this door knocking and doing, I'm not practicing what I preach, but I wish I would have known that he was running and collecting signatures when he was running and collecting signatures, because that's where I have experience, right? As a third person with a third party, knowing what's needed to overcome, um, you know, the challenges that are gonna come. So we see this, right? And if you look at your community, I think almost all of our communities will see it where you have that flash of like a candidate that's just running because someone pissed them off, right? And that means it's one of the many signals that you know there is a demand for independent politics. There is a demand for an alternative party. There is a demand for something different. And we have to be there ready for those flashpoints, right? We have, because because if we had had, if my Green Party had had basically a bomb set off in the middle of it last year because of some stuff that happened with a member, like we might have been prepared to lift that person up in that moment, in that flashpoint, right? And support them. Um, so again, like, right, people aren't alien, are, aren't apathetic, they're alienated. And and they withdraw from it because you can only participate in your own destruction consciously for so long, right? It it wears down on you, and you either do one of two things: you explode and run a run a firebrand grassroots campaign that loses, or you uh, withdraw and you you focus your your you know efforts elsewhere in your community. Um, we can build, you know, so we need to build a base by filling the political vacuum for this working class. Right. We need to prioritize outreach to black, black, next communities, color, youth, uh, queer folks, um, you know, across the board, the oppressed and marginalized. Right. If, if you're in an area that has, uh, you know, if you're in a more rural area, like rural folks are marginalized as hell. Right. Rural communities have been completely abandoned economically, politically across the board. The, the reason that we see this deep red um you know rule divide in the united states in, in my opinion is more because that no one else but the republicans is there right they've been abandoned by the democrats they've been abandoned by socialists they've been abandoned by progressives all they have is libertarians and, and republicans um and, and they're there to stir hate right and to, to other and to blame others for the problems that are actually caused by capitalism right you're the, the collapse of the small farm is because of capitalism. The outsourcing of rural manufacturing is because of, is because of capitalism. The, the effects of climate change are because of capitalism, right? But the only people they have speaking to them are capitalists. Um, you know, so we, we need to kind of qualify the lead and think about who we're talking to. And uh, another, I think, key thing when we're qualifying the lead is who has material interest in change, right? If someone... Who's going to, you know, hypothetical, who's going to fight harder for Medicare for all, the uninsured person or the or the union member with a sweet, you know, contract negotiated deal? Well, all the AFL-CIO and their opposition to medical, Medicare for all tells us that, right? They're going to they're gonna bail on it, right? Um, and it's not true across the board, right? There, there are people of privilege who have health insurance who will fight tooth and nail for it. 
Um, but most of the time, I'm going to place my money that uh, when the going gets tough, it's the person who needs it, the person with that material interest that's going to you know, stick through to the end and not take a, a buy-off half measure. Um, organizing means we're, we need to be facilitating working class, class folks getting together to make their own decisions, uh, learn democratic processes through experience. Um, you know, our society doesn't encourage this. Our society doesn't encourage democratic decision making. Our society doesn't encourage, uh, you know, collective discussion. Um, our, our, I, I, it came up in my personal life with someone, re, you know, with something recently. That just the re-realization that our society does not provide avenues for conflict resolution, for restorative justice, for any of these things, right? So we have to condition ourselves and train ourselves to actually do these things, to break the mold of authoritarianism that we're, we're you know, living in and raised in. Um, that means, you know, educational and social movement projects, not only electoral campaigns, uh, we've got to be part of the organizing, right? Um, we've got to be in, you know, in our communities 24-7, 365, not just uh, coming around for finite campaigns. And when we do come around for a finite campaign, we need to start at the bottom, right? We need to start with uh, ideally people from the movement, right? Not, not someone coming in to advocate, but uh, someone who wants to speak for themselves and their community. And we kind of mentioned it earlier, but I think another important point to remember is that you know the same kind of issues arise in community and issue organizing um, with democratic front groups. Uh, there's there's a saying that I did Google, I, I didn't I meant to Google it, but I didn't to see if I could find a source. But uh, the Democratic Party is the graveyard of social movements. Uh, I'm sure every person on the left has heard it. I'm sure most people on the left have said it, um, but it's true, right? Whether it be political parties like the Labor Party, um, you know, or social movements, we the Democratic Party tends to corrupt, tends to absorb and corrupt, right? Um, you get like how we would say during 2020, they get lost in the sauce, even if they can keep their identity. But usually they don't even do that. Usually there might be some baseline level appeasement that brings them in to you know, kind of like that New Deal coalition, right? Um, you, you get a little, you come in, and then you find out that you're just dis you're be you're slowly fading away, or you're just immediately fading away. Um, so you know there are a litany of Democratic Party line community and issue groups that serve as funnel energy in supporting Democratic parties and attempting to influence policy from within. Um, these organizations vary in their connection from official connections, right, um, where you're officially part of, you know, your Democratic Party apparatus, um, all the way to, you know, um, non-partisan organizations whose mem leadership are simply Democrats, and therefore that's the only perspective that is allowed at the table. Um, you know, it, it doesn't even have to be conscious all the time. Um, I, I remember that, uh, um, I remember when I, during Occupy, we were meeting in our local AFSCME headquarters. And uh, during one of the meetings, I raised the question, should we start finding a new meeting place? Because the elections are coming up and we're meeting under a picture of Obama. Um, and that suggestion was taken very badly by the Democrats in the room who could not believe I would accuse them of, you know, having any kind of um, allegiance to the party over the movement, um, and they got even more mad when I told them to come talk to me next April, when they would all be gone, and uh, come next April, they were all gone, working on Democratic campaigns, right? Um, so even you know, in, in a movement like Occupy, um, there was those unconscious guides. Um, so what this means is that much of the civic energy in our society is being co-opted and often funded by capitalist interests, right? Um, so for the same reason, and, and that funding is a linchpin, right? That funding is key, like we talked about, right? When you build your funding on capitalist, you know, sources, 
and the capitalists have the baseball bat. That's a very, very precarious house of cards that you've built. Um, you know, and, and more so than parties, maybe these social or organ, civic organizations are beholden to those donors, right? They have staffs and, and all kinds of things that are reliant on that, that next uh, benevolent check coming in. Um, so that's that same reason we, you know, we must have independent political parties that are independent of capital. Um, our social movements have to be as well. Um, you know, it, it, it makes me think of a job I almost got a decade ago where um, I applied to be a, a political director for a not an environmental not-for-profit. Um, everything went well. I thought I had the job. I got a call from the executive director personally to tell me they really, really loved me. But someone with 25 years experience applied for the job too. Um, and they had to make a choice between someone who could hit the ground running right now and someone who was more in line with their where they wanted to go but would need to build there. And so they took the short-term choice. And just a few months later, while I was with other fractivists sitting in outside of our, gov our governor's office and people were taking arrests on a daily basis opposing a uh, calling for a moratorium on fracking in Illinois, that person who got the job being instead of me was in the governor's office with the oil and gas industry, with the Sierra Club, writing the law that legalized fracking in Illinois. Um, so when push came to shove, um, probably partially, um, you know, related to that person in charge, internal bias, right? That they, they had an experienced lobbyist who was used to working for compromise, not for values. Um, but also, um, I am sure that funding was on the line on how they came down on those fights um, so oh yeah we we have a number of environmental organizations in pennsylvania that are that way that you know kind of rely on the democratic machine as part of their fundraising and outreach and and um it, they get stuck in that same lesser evil argument of like supporting the democratic party that at every level in pennsylvania from our local in pittsburgh up to the state um has been in favor of fracking has been in favor of expanding the petrochemical industry and, and all of these uh, environmental problems that we're seeing in the state. Uh, the Democrats have been behind that and have pushed it, but you end up with these nonprofits that call them the climate champions compared to the Republicans, right? Because they, they pick the, the lesser evils, so to speak, even though all of this is bipartisan legislation. Um, and uh, you know, they're, the emphasis starts to be on um, what the donors want, that the, what the donors are telling the Democratic Party. And so you start to see an emphasis on, instead of getting rid of fracking, it's, well, we want to work with the governor to try to uh, put sensible regulations on how much emissions that fracking should have. And, and you, you could see how things start to get watered down because of being involved in, in the Democratic Party, because of being involved with their donors, because of this sense that, you know, you have to compromise with capitalism as opposed to, uh, you know, building a movement that's really going to demand something different. And so instead you see citizens movements. Instead, um, we have citizens uh, movements that are independent that have, for example, in some townships in Western Pennsylvania, they at the local level uh, passed local ordinances to ban fracking within their municipality. They can't by themselves change the state, but they can ban it in their municipality. And so, you know, they're taking a stand against Republicans and Democrats by organizing themselves locally in these independent groups. And I think we can take a lot of, um, uh, you know, learn a lot from those from those experiences. Uh, you know, the key thing being, we have to remain independent. So we're come. That's we're coming to the close on this one. But you know, just to reiterate, right? The Green Party is both an activist organization and an electoral party, right? Um, and multi tendency, right? We started off. We started off with quotes from Debs, Marx, Lenin, and Emma Goldman. Um, we covered a pretty good span of the left. Um, you know, so it, it's important to keep this in mind, right? Because we just talked a whole lot about parties 
and in the very narrow view of the you know role of political parties in the United States and the role of memberless parties in the United States, that means that um, it kind of often just gets blurred into just electoralism, right? Um, but part of being independent means that we need our movements to be independent too, right? Um, that these the the movement side and the electoral side are are two parts of a, a larger strategy, um, and not not either or decisions that we have to make. So, um, and, and we and we really have to extend that. Uh, make sure that we're extending that into that. Uh, that independence through all of our politics, through all of our organizing. Um, that said, uh, we went a little longer than I wanted, but not too bad. Um, like we said, this is our first time doing this this specific topic. Um, I'm sure we will come back to it at another at another point, um, you know, with a little bit of an update. But uh, if you want to, you know, learn more about us, you know, here at the Green Socialist Organizing Project. Uh, you can go to greensocialist.net. Um, we've got lots of ways you can get involved. You can get involved in political education, which is these workshops, these one-on-ones. Uh, we just did our Ukraine uh, Green Socialist Perspectives on Ukraine panel uh, last week. We've got you know our, our weekly podcast with Howie. We're working on another theory, political theory podcast right now. Um, so there's lots of things you can do with us in education. Um, we have lists of things to do that are far larger than we can uh, accomplish at our current capacity. Uh, so we'd be more than happy to have you involved. You can get involved in party building work um, and elect, helping support election campaigns and uh, working on different issues, things, whether that be white paper policy statements or, you know, getting trying to organize actual, you know, movement stuff. Um, you can go sign up at greensocialist.net. You can become a member of the organization, which you know helps us pay for StreamYard to do this and all that kind of stuff. Uh, keep our websites up, that that you know, that all that. Um, but also, we said you need membership organizations. So uh, we have monthly meetings. Our last monthly meeting was actually last Sunday. Um, you know, we talk about strategy. We talk about what we're doing. We talk about current events in the Green Party in the world. Um, and uh, you know, there you can get involved and actually guide, you know, our work here in the Green Socialist Organizing Project. Um, and uh, specifically, if you want to get involved in our education working group, I, uh, I encourage you to sign up, you know, via the, the main sign up on the website. Uh, but you can also email me directly at chris at howiehawkins.us. Um, and with that, uh, thank you very much, everybody. And um, let me see if there's any last minute. Yeah, um, yeah thank you every, very much, everybody. And we will see you next month, uh, fourth Tuesday of every month at 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we're continuing these 101s. Um, like I said at the beginning, you know, we, we've, uh, in 2022, we went Green Party Eco Socialism Organizing, Green Party Eco Socialism Organizing. Uh, they were long, they dove into a lot of things. So in 2023, our focus is to kind of break out a little. And uh, this independent politics was our first 101 breakout where we uh, talked about this topic that frankly had been talked about in every single workshop before um, and, and clearly deserved its, uh, you know, its own time. If you have a suggestion, right, on uh, a topic that we um, could do on these 101s, um, go ahead and throw it in the chat or uh, send me, like I said, send me an email at chris at howiehawkins.us and uh, we can see what we can do. But uh, have a good evening, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next month. See you then.